This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. Awesome. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16. I'm reading out the New Living Translation. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to come up on the screen behind me. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us, des gives us desires that are the opposite of of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, adultery, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Give God a hand for the reading of the word. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're kind of catching up with us the last four weeks, I've been uh, just talking about the fruit that God desires of our life. We started in John 15. For four weeks, we hung out in John 15 about the fruit that God expects. What does it mean to bear fruit, have fruit? So I'm going to run you through. It will be very quick, but I'm going to run you through the last four weeks so everybody's caught up recapitulate it over and over so it becomes part of your natural thinking. And then today I want to turn a corner with what Ryan read and uh, kind of just start making it practical. So we, we kind of, we're going to look at some of the theology today and then uh, next week, this is a part two today, so I'm going to let you know. Uh, next week we will kind of take theology and practical. How, how does it work in my life? How does this work in my home? How does it work with my family? Of where we're going. So let's just run through them real quick. I'm going to go through them quickly. So the first thing, John 15, 2, is that God expects fruit and he wants you to produce more. God's definition of fruit, Revelation 3, 17, we said, was different than our own. We say it's about riches, retirement, family, houses, and cars. And Jesus says, no, it's about something else. God's first words, this is, we went to Genesis next. In Genesis 1, 28, the very first words God ever spoke to humans were be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and govern. We took that thought, the government, and tied it to this, that God's definition of fruitfulness was connected to government. It's not connected to all the things you do. Read your Bible, pray, pray, do this, fast, all the things we call fruit. Uh, God started out that that's not the fruit he's looking for. It's about his government. And then his government was his wisdom that resides in his command. And he told Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit, and uh, they couldn't even obey one command, so we came to this. The fruit God expects is obedience to his command, which is his wisdom. So God wants you to obey his wisdom, but the reality of that is, and we laughed about it, 
Uh, we couldn't obey one command. God gave us 10. We blew those. We added 670 plus more. We can't obey those. So Jesus came to make it a little simple and clear. Jesus said it's just about two commands. You must love the Lord God with all your heart. And the second one is your neighbor as yourself. And we made a joke. We can't even do those either. So we, we did land on this that uh, all we have to do is keep the commands and be good. This was Romans 2. And we can have eternal life. Problem with that. And this is kind of where we start landing the plane last week. There's infallible proof that we, all of us in this room, cannot obey God or be good. Everybody raise your hand on that one, right? We try to be good. We want to be good. But we all are our own lawbreakers. So we came to we're hopeless people. And we made everybody kind of make this profession of faith. I'm rich, miserable, poor, naked, and blind. Hopeless, right? That, and that was a good thing. We wanted to come to hopelessness. Because when you're hopeless and you realize it's not you... It's only Jesus is the hope. So Jesus became the way we could have fruit, and this is what we found out as we run through, that if we consistently fail to obey, then what does God really expect out of me? And, and then if you're not careful, what, what we do is we say, well, God just loves me like I am. He has no expectations. He just wants me to love Jesus. And we said, no, no, he still has expectations, and this was it. And we love this, that we cannot produce what God expects through human effort. And everybody in the room's tried. We've all tried human effort to impress God. I'll quit smoking. I'll stop cussing. I'll quit sleeping around. Please forgive me, God, in my best effort. Amen. Doesn't work. Here's the plane that landed at the airport last week. We're going to take a new one off. The only way to produce the fruit God expects is through the Holy Spirit, which is what Ryan just read. Now, what I would like to do, if this, and I went through that quickly, but if this is true, there's nothing Mark Evans can do to please God in my own effort. We will try to, right, Ryan? We'll try. We'll bargain with God. Oh, if you'll forgive me, I swear I'll go to church more. I'll give more money if you'll help me. We make bargains. God knows you're going to break the bargain. You're lawbreakers. That's why there's the necessity of Christ. But Christ leans into that the only way this is possible, and what Ryan read is, we have to keep in step with the Spirit of God. And this is why, for those of you who have been saved a while, and you went to vacation Bible school, or you've read your Bible, you've heard the phrase, the fruit of the Spirit. Well, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness self-control, right? And we throw them out there. But we don't understand that that's not given to you for a vacation Bible school sermon or a song from Veggie Tales. Got to be old to know that one. <laughs> it's given to you to show you that the only way you'll ever get the fruit is to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. There is no other way. So what I want to do today is the next two to three weeks, because I'm not going to rush this, so... I, I want to just teach you how does this ethereal person of the Godhead that we call the Spirit, how does He move in your life so you can produce the fruit? Because I'm not going to talk about this today, but it is a thought for the future. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, and that seems so oxymoron. Is it really self, me controlling self, or is it the Spirit giving me the ability to control myself. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It just seems weird. But I'll teach you how that happens practically. Now here's the problem. When we talk about Jesus, it's easy to know that. Who, him. Because he's a human. We can kind of picture what he looks like. You know, we can go back to all the antiquities of art and the Jesus on the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Watch Ricky Bobby, the ballad of Ricky Bobby. Some people like their Jesus in a cut-off T-shirt at a Leonard Skinner concert. You know, I mean, we just, we all have our Jesus. And we can connect with him because he's a human. But when you use the word Holy Spirit, it gets weird. Because the Holy Spirit is also referred to as a ghost, the Holy Ghost. You have to be Pentecostal to do that one. The Holy Ghost, you know. But it lends itself that that's just weird. It's a ghost. He's referred to in the Bible as the wind. 
He's also referred to as an object lesson as a bird. So if you really follow this through, God is telling me the only way you will ever produce fruit is seen in the form of a wind and a bird and a ghost. Good luck. How do I have a relationship with the wind? How do I have a relationship with a bird, the dove, right? I mean, it seems so ironic. I'll, as, I, as we go deeper, I'll tell you why it was chosen as a bird. But for now, let's just hang on what we've got to hang on today. But that's kind of the problem is that the spirit is so hard to define. Like, how do you define a ghost? How do you define wind? Jesus just says it this way when he's talking about the wind. He says, well, you really can't box the wind in, but you definitely feel his effects. You can see the effects of the wind as it blows. Here's what I'll say. I've never seen the Spirit, but I've definitely felt him work in my life. I, I, I can't tell you what he looks like, but I know I've felt his power. So I want to teach you how this works. So let's run through them. We're going to go to the book of Genesis today. And let's click through these. So the next one. Before we produce the fruit of the Spirit, rather than trying to define love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and trying to define how does that work in my life, let's just go back and talk about the character of the Spirit. Because if I can know His character... I can better understand how He works in my life. Now, I'm just going to give you three things that are very important in a minute. But I want you to look at this, because this is where I'm going to take you in the next few weeks. The way I can know how the Spirit works is by seeing the Spirit in the seven days of creation working. I want you to put up Romans chapter 1, if you will. If you'll turn in your Bible to Romans 1... Uh, I, I want to just read something that may enlighten you to what's at stake when I talk about the Holy Spirit. It's a comment that Jesus makes in Romans chapter 1 or Paul, but um, it, it's really weird when you read it. We'll start reading in verse 18. So Romans 1 and then verse 18 is where we'll start reading. But God shows His anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now watch, this is, gets really interesting. They know the truth about God because He has made it obvious. Now that's why I need you to ponder real quick. God is not trying to hide from you what He wants. Some people think He's got this mystery out there and you've got to go dig it out. He's making it very clear what he wants. He's made it obvious. Now, how does he make it obvious? Verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, watch, because this is where we're going to go, they can clearly see what? All right, hold, leave that verse up there if you don't mind. And watch. His eternal power, that's the Spirit, and His divine nature. So what Paul is going to tell me here, last line, you have no excuse not to know God. <laughs> now here's how I don't have an excuse. I can't, I can't say I don't know God because God says, no, 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 wait a minute. Look at my earth and look at the sky. And through my creation... You will clearly see, watch, because this is mind-blowing, my invisible qualities. That means that spirit that is an ethereal ghost, a wind, a mist, a cloud, a fire, a, a bird. And it's hard to kind of, the only way we humans can define the spirit is with we draw a dove and go, oh, that's the spirit. The, the cross is easy. The cross, Jesus hung on it. Holy Ghost, bird. And that's just weird. Like the person of the Godhead that is supposed to help me through the hell of life is a bird? But what he's teaching me is that through, and this is not, again, where I'm going next week, but, but through 
because he's connected to an animal, the Spirit of God is connected to an animal. The reason he did that is to show me that the invisible power of God in the Spirit can be seen through the qualities of that which God created. In other words, I can look at nature and go, that's God, that's God, this is God, that's how God works, this is how He moves, this is how... just watching nature. So where I want to take us is, I want to take us to this point, if we want to pull the slides back up. Over the next several weeks, I want to take us through the seven days of creation, and through the creation, we will define the invisible nature of the Holy Spirit. So long before the book of Acts, when he shows up in a tongue of fire, over my, and I'm, I'm speaking in tongues, he was going to be part of the original creation. Now watch, if what we read in, 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 I'm Psalm, in Romans was true, if what we read in Romans was true, I believe it is, it's the Word of God, then that means that I can see the nature and character of the Spirit, the invisible quality which is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Father. I can see that in the seven literal days of creation. In every day I can go, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So I could have ten characteristic, or ten, seven characteristic definitions of the Holy Spirit. Now once I know His character, I will begin to go, oh, and that's how the fruit comes out of my life. Now here's Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. So we're two verses into the Bible. And here's what we get. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What did Romans tell us about the heaven and earth He created? After this first sentence, I will start being able to define the invisible things of God. Right? That's Romans 1. This is Genesis 1. Romans 1, through the creation of God, you can see the invisible characters, His power and His nature. Genesis 1, hey, I created heaven and earth. So before we even get into the Bible and talk about all the hard stuff, you know, Nephilim and giants and all of that that we like, the aliens and dinosaurs and all of that, the behemoth and all of the things in Job, God already is letting you know in verse 1 I started it, I created it, I gave you the heavens, I gave you the earth, and through this moment you can know all there is to know about me. That's pretty powerful. So ver- uh, sentence one of verse one is, and let's land here, God desires to be known. Because what he's going to do in the next seven days is make his character known. So, therefore, in the seven days of creation, I'm not just looking at the days of creation. I've written a book on this. It's still got to go to print, but it's finished. Every day of creation is a revelation of God's character. So, and And it's a systematic revelation of His character, meaning He won't reveal day three of His character until He's revealed days one and two. That's why some people can be saved for years and still not know the fullness of God's character because they're trying to get to day seven by skipping day two and three. You can't skip creation days and know the fullness of His character. What I, I'll work this out next week. This is next week's teaching. The days of creation, because you are a new creation, will work themselves out in your life systematically. So that God, you can know the fullness of God. Here's what it says. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. It's amazing that God wants to be known, but darkness is trying to cover it all. He doesn't want you to know. Lucifer, the covering angel, the covering cherub Lucifer, has covered the darkness of the earth. He doesn't want you to know God. And then watch verse 2, <laughs> connecting back to Romans again. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. We don't even get through verse 2 that God has already shown me 
the Spirit of God is going to be integral, 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 it's a word. He's going to be, I don't even know, it just left my brain. It felt really good. The Spirit of God is going to be necessary. (laughs) That felt better. (laughs) The Spirit of God is necessary. He's going to be part of the creation. Now watch, just so you know. If the Holy Spirit was necessary for the original creation and to produce the fruit of the Father in the original creation, would He not therefore be necessary for the new creation? So if God is going to produce the Father, if the Father is going to produce fruit on the planet called Earth that He expects, but He needs the Spirit to pull that off, would it not therefore mean that when the new creation comes along and I'm a new creation in Christ, Ryan, would it not assume therefore that God's still going to say, hey Mark, Ryan, the only way you're going to produce the fruit is you're going to have to have my spirit over your life. If he expected it in the new creation, he also, or in the old creation, he expects it in the new, the Christian salvation. Now here's the beauty of this thing. Once we get into verse 3, it all starts becoming manifest. The invisible qualities of God start showing up in every day of creation. Telling me this, that the person who's living by the Spirit, is what Ryan read today, begins to manifest realities of God in their life. Meaning, if you're born again and the Spirit is working in you, you will naturally manifest qualities of God in your life. If you're not manifesting qualities of God in your life, your home, your marriage, your kids, your work, your money, you're not, then what Ryan read is true. You're just not walking by the Spirit. You're walking by human effort. Is this making sense? I don't want to I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm losing something here. But I I am hammering at home. If you think, you're hammering this home. I'm really trying to let you see we're futile to try to do life without the Spirit. All right, so I'm going to give you three things now out of this verse, and here they are. Now, uh, if you'll leave this, I want you to just leave this up here because I'm going to read some verses, but I just want you to see this. The first thing the Holy Spirit is doing is he's always working to bring me from chaos into clarity. In other words, he's trying to take my mess and move it to God's message. I I did two M's. I I don't know if I like mess and message, but in the moment it felt good. (laughs) I alliterated it. (laughs) I was trying to come up with problem and promise. I don't know. But whatever, he's going from chaos to clarity. How many of you will say living on this planet you've bumped into chaos? Yeah, you married them. Yeah, you, you want to know chaos, get married. Two people trying to become one is chaotic. Especially if he doesn't pick his underwear up. Right? Chaos. Now let me show you why I believe this. Remember, the three things we're going to look at, we're going to look at all seven days next week, but I want to just talk about three things about the Spirit inside the seven days that are working all the time. And the first thing you have to know about the Spirit is He gets giddy when you're in chaos. Because it's going to demand you to trust Him. And when chaos hits my life, I want to be in charge. I don't want the Spirit. I want to be in charge. And so because I handle my own chaos, I run to the alcohol. I run to the drugs. I run to the porn. I run to the anger. I I slam doors. I drop the F-bomb or whatever. Because a human wants to control the chaos. And there's a lot of Christians going, God, man, could you do something about the chaos in my marriage, the chaos at my work, the chaos in my children? And he's like, I'm trying, honey. But if you don't know the Spirit, you're never coming out of chaos. You will simply live in human effort and wear yourself out trying to fix it all. (laughs) Now here's why I said that, and I'll let you study it for the sake of time. Every day that is created, days one through seven, this is day one. 
God called the light day and the darkness night. Every day, 1 through 7, ends this way. The evening passed and the morning came and then that marked the next day. To understand this, it's really weird. You would think the morning came and then it got dark. That's day one. The Bible flips the script and says the evening first, then the morning came, and then that was a day. To work this out, I'm not going to get too deep on Hebrew here, but the words that are used, the word evening, we would say, well, it's getting dark, I can't see really good, right? I mean, the sun's going down, I can't see as good, I don't drive good at night. When it's getting dark, I need to stay home. The word evening is best translated as to be obscure. It's not clear. I can't see it well. But the morning light is, oh, I can see clearly now the rain has gone. I can see all, right? The the light comes and we see. That's just normal. Turn the lights on, oh, I see better. Well, what God is teaching me about the Spirit is that the Spirit will always show up in the obscurity to lead you into the clarity. He is trying to take that which doesn't make sense and make sense out of it. I don't understand why my marriage is, question mark. And the Spirit says, good, I'm glad you said that. Would you like me to help you with this non-understanding of why your marriage isn't working because I can bring some clarity to this obscurity. Well, I've read everything. I've read books. I've checked his phones. I don't understand why he's not pursuing me. Something must be going on. There might be another woman. What if he's cheating on me? Obscurity. And humans are obsessed with obscurity. It's called Google. (laughs) It's, it's It's predicting your search before you ever even search. And we love information. Man, we're sharing it all over the place. Pedophiles in Hollywood, information. Because we love to get light to the obscurity. We feel woke when we do. Well, what God is trying to do is woke you. He's trying to say you humans are trying to determine your obscurity by trusting Amazon, Google, your favorite social influencer, And what I want you to know is that I'm the one that will bring the clarity. So every time you read, and the evening and the morning was, read it this way. And it was obscure, but then it got more clear on day two. Because on day two, there's nothing there, but day one is finished. It's pretty clear, but when you step into day two, it's empty, obscure, chaos. But then God breaks something out of day two and day three and day. So here's what we can know about the Spirit. If you're in the middle of hell and chaos, fear not. He gets giddy in those times. Because he's like, now it's time for my invisible quality to bring them some clarity to their stupidity. And I love it. The problem is what Ryan read. The Holy Spirit's like, it's time for me to shine. And you're over here trusting yourself. And he's tapping you on the shoulder going, ready now, ready now, me, me, ready now, I'm ready, I'm ready, I can heal this marriage, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Oh, you're Googling again, okay, I'll wait. (laughs) Okay, you ready now? You Googled everything, you're in miserable fear, you think he's cheating, you've almost proven it, you ready now? Okay, I'll wait, I'll just hold on. I think that's kind of what he does a lot. I think he's tapping me on the shoulder going, I'm ready, I'm ready to bring some chaos, Mark, I'm ready to help that clarity out, I'm ready to really help you here. Oh, Mark's cussing again. Mark's losing his temper again. Mark's in a deep, dark depression of fear again. Laying in bed, God, if you can just do anything, help me. And he's laying beside you going, I'm trying. (laughs) I'm really trying to help you. Right? I I generally think he's doing that. Like there's a lot of people that think God is trying to keep it from you to teach you something. He's not trying to keep it from you. He's trying to get it to you. It's just that it's so much easier to trust me in the chaos because I do trust myself 
and I trust my feelings and I trust what I think and I trust my knowledge and I trust my education and I trust the doctors, I trust the vaccines, I trust the news. I just trust it all until it doesn't work. Number two, what is the Holy Spirit doing? He has one goal for you. It's not to give you a new car or a new house or a new wife or new children. His one goal is holy rest in the wisdom of God. I didn't say rest, it's holy rest. Rest is, I could just take a pill and chill. Rest is, I, I had almost one too many to drink, but I sure am feeling good right now. Holy rest is different than rest. Rest is, all the kids are at grandma's, my feet are kicked up, I'm fishing. That's rest. Amen. Amen. I threw that out to you because I just felt drawn to you all of a sudden. <laughs> but I mean, really, it is restful. For me, it's guitar playing. My, my kids will say, oh, that's all he does at home is play guitar. So it's because I live with all women, right? So <laughs> not as, I'll noodle for two hours just pretending I'm famous. <laughs> but but it, does calm my, it does calm me down. I have to be careful. My, my, my dad-in-law was an alcoholic. My dad-in-law. My granddad was an alcoholic, a bad one. So I, I, have to, I would have to be very careful with alcohol because with my personality, if I drink alcohol, I just get real chill. I'm like, oh, man, I love the world. <laughs> man, the birds are singing now. You know, I mean, it would be easy, and if I'm not careful, I could turn into an alcoholic because it could be an open door. But I am letting you know I'm not talking about that kind of rest that you can work yourself. I'm talking about something that comes only from the Holy Spirit. That's not connected to natural things, but it's connected to an inward peace. An inward thing that whether you're fishing or not, or having your sip of wine or not, or whatever you're doing, you're at peace. Because it's a holy rest, and He's trying to move you there. That's day seven. Now watch, this is going to help you for next week. That holy rest is day seven. We want that on day one. And God's like, no, you don't get holy rest on day one. I'm sorry. I got to work you through something to get you to holy rest. I didn't just show up and create day seven and make that day one. The reason most Christians never get to holy rest, and look at the last line, he rested from all his, what's the last three words? Work of creation. What was the work of creation? To display my invisible qualities. What God is teaching me, when all of his invisible qualities are working in your life, you will be at rest. So if you're not at rest in an area, there's nine fruits of the Spirit, if you're not at rest in an area of your life, it simply means this. Not that the devil's too big or you're too carnal. It means that there's an area of his invisible quality that you've missed. And you need to seek that out. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what aspect of the new creation am I missing in my Heavenly Father that will bring me rest in this situation that is wearing me out mentally. You see how this thing is much more relational than it is religious. It's learning to commune with Him. The Holy Spirit has one goal, holy rest. Now here's the last one we'll end here, and then we'll, we'll pick up next week with all seven days of creation. This one just hurts. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want this to be true, but when I read the Bible, I find it is true. The Holy Spirit's work is a process, not a moment. I will. Thank you. I just love preaching to this side over here. You better say that. I'm like, I will. It makes me feel good when you talk back to me. Thank you, by the way. I like that. I was raised in, in a Pentecostal church, and one thing I know about Pentecostal, well, it was a great church, by the way, but one thing I know about spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Pentecostal, Bible-thumping, devil-killing Christians is we like it to happen now. I want you to slap my husband on the head with that oil and lay him out in the Holy Ghost. And when he gets up, I want him totally different. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, in my 30 years of pastoring, that's rare. 
I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not saying God doesn't lay somebody out in the Holy Ghost and they get up and they're no longer a drug addict or addicted. or, I mean, they're just totally brand new. But that's rare. What I do see is they're totally brand new, but there's still a war. And that war is a process, not a moment at the altar. We have been told by religion that your hope is to come to an altar. Cry, pray, snot everywhere, leave your cigarettes on the altar, and walk out the door different. I'm not opposed to that by any means. I would just challenge you this. This would be good for those of you who love to study the Bible. The altar is really not even talked about in the New Testament. That's an Old Testament concept. It's an Old Testament concept. You went to the altar, you shed the blood. New Testament, I don't see any altar. The altar is the, is the Holy Spirit in your life. So I say this, an altar call is not an altar call at all unless it alters your call. So you're different. And whether that's in your bedroom, your car... But I do know this, and this hurts. It's been in my own life. I do know the Holy Spirit's working, but it's often a process, and that frustrates people. That's why the fruit of the Spirit, one of them is patience. Because sometimes I don't feel like He's working. Sometimes I feel like He forgot me. Sometimes I feel like He's not answering my prayer. I know, I know, I know, because you're really wanting to get to day seven and he's wanting to push you back to day three because you missed something. See, he's working a process day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. And a lot of times if there's no rest for Mark, then I need to backtrack and go, where in days one through six did I miss the work of his creation? Because every day, I'll show you next week, every day is a revelation of what the Spirit is trying to work out in your life. It's a process. I don't know why God does it that way. I wish we could just pray and instantly it all happened. Those are called miracles and they do still happen today. But there's something about the process that just, I don't know, it just makes you strong. It it causes you to trust Him when there's seemingly no reason to trust Him. It causes you to run to His Word when everything in your brain is saying, but it doesn't work. It's causing you to say, but his word, he's still a faithful God even though I don't feel like he's being faithful to me. So in the process, what you're learning, Carmelo, the process of it is you're learning more about the Father. But the devil, rather than you learning more about how good the Father is, the devil lies. He's not a good Father. He forgot you. He won't heal you. He won't honor that prayer. He won't honor his word. You're, you're a sorry, no good Because the devil knows the Spirit's trying to work that. Now, what is the process? The process is not you becoming something better. The process is the more revelation of the Father's character. So as I'm going through something and I'm like, man, I just wish this would end. It's just, oh, I'm praying. Man, I've done about all I can do. I've fasted. I've... I've cast the devil out. I've had hands laid on me. I've been anointed with oil. I mean, I'm listening to preaching. My house is filled with worship. I've cried. I've laughed. I've shouted. I've I've commanded. I've I've just done everything. And, and, And if we're not careful, we'll suddenly get discouraged. But really, the process is not you figuring out how to get healed. The process is just as you're doing that, The Father wants to say, and I'm there the whole time. I will honor my word. I will do what I've said I would do. You can trust me, Mark. So in the process, what we have to do is we have to remind ourselves not to get discouraged. I would use this word better. Uh, Cameron, you can come on up. I I would use this word better. The process, James 1, Romans 1, Genesis 1, James 1. In the process, if you're not careful, you become double-minded. And a double-minded person gets nothing from the Father. And I will tell you, if there's one thing the process does, it's here. Can I trust Him? Yes, no. I'm going to. That was a great sermon. I'm going to leave here trusting Him. Five o'clock tonight. I wish God would show up. 
that double-mindedness of my head. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just focus a moment to the Holy Spirit, whatever, however that looks to you. Now, I would love to know where you are in your process. <laughs> Some of you are further along than others. Some of you are just at rest. You're like, yeah, I'm in the middle of chaos, but I'm at rest. I'm good. God's bringing more clarity. Maybe you're frustrated with God and you're like, God, I just don't understand. Why? Where are you? I've, I've prayed. Nothing's happening. I don't, don't lose sight of holy rest because you're frustrated in day three. Just keep trusting Him. Wake up every day. Holy Spirit, bring me some clarity today. If there's something I need to work on, bring me some clarity today. If there's an area in my life that needs a more revelation of your character, Holy Spirit, if you'll make it clear, I will trust your power. Holy Spirit, I've done everything I know to do as a human. I'm kind of at wits in here what to do, but I want you to know that I'll just trust your wisdom and your fruit and then just rest Now, what I would like you to leave with today, because the way we end our services is in communion, and it's a time where you engage with God, whatever He said to you, you, uh, you know, you make, you take responsibility. So, communion is not a religious thing here; it's it's us taking responsibility for what we heard. Uh, you know, we're putting our action to it by taking communion. Yes, I just heard it. I will take communion to go. Yes, I will put that into practice. I'll teach you how to put it into practice practically, but for today. Would you just leave here believing that there's hope for your chaos? And if you've just been, you know, maybe even suicidal thinking, just divorce thinking, frustrated, your future, your calling, and you just really have gotten frustrated, I think a great way to go home today is leave that frustration here at this communion table and just go out of here going, well, I don't see clearly yet, but I know clarity's coming. Clarity is coming. And you begin to think that way. Clarity is coming. And when you're in the process and it doesn't feel very clear, it, it's okay. The Holy Spirit's going to bring clarity. He's going to bring clarity. And when He does, I'm going to obey. I'm going to follow His fruit. So stand with me, if you will. Uh, again, the way we end, it's um, rather than you know an altar call, so to speak, this is a moment where we let you do that yourself. We're here to pray. Our elders, Ryan, they're over to my left and right. Miss Patty's here. Uh, we just love to pray for you if you need prayer. We like to engage with you if you want us to engage with you. But really, the altar call is between you and what the Spirit wants to do in you. And so when you come here to this table, we've got our baskets for those that call this place home. We do our giving. But for the message, the bread is broken, the juice is there, representing what Jesus has done for you. There's no hope without Him. What chaos is in your life? Holy Spirit, bring clarity to this chaos. And then, once you're here, if you want to go back and sit down, uh, Cameron and Victoria Kate are going to lead worship. You can worship with them. Uh, if you need to slip out, you can. It, the, our service is over. You can go anytime you want, but we also make room for you to engage with the Spirit. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray that what we heard will take root in our life. And God, we will apply it, that in creation, you're bringing your character out. So God, in this process we call life, marriage problems, financial problems, may rather than seeing the mess, may we see your life. May we see your character. May we see your fatherhood. And may the frustrations of the chaos and the anxiety that the chaos has brought to us as we take communion today to celebrate your life, death, and resurrection. God, may we find peace in that. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. At the end of the prayer, you may come. Just pray this after me. Heavenly Father, can't do this on my own. Tired of my human effort. And today, I recognize my need for Jesus. He's my only hope. He's the life of the Father. And I receive His life now. His life for my life. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Bring me the life of the Father that I may produce the fruit that you want me to produce. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us on the Believer's Church YouTube channel. If you would like more information about Believer's Church, you can visit mybelieverschurch.com. If there is anything that you need prayer for, please email us at amen at mybelieverschurch.com. Be sure to check back next week for a brand new message.